you don't mind, we'll just um, pray before I deliver this message. And if you bow your heads with me, we'll just pray. Loving Father in heaven, as we come before you again, as always, Lord, we need your presence, we need your Holy Spirit. Father, as we present the message today, we pray that your words will be put in my mouth, Lord, and that you'll help us take us through the different things that we will be presented with today, and that, Lord, you will teach us new things. Father in heaven, I pray for help personally. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll forgive me on my sin as I stand before your people. And as I present the message, Lord, I pray that you'll help me present the message in the way that we've planned together through the week. Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just loading it in. Okay, so as some of you are aware, if you look at the title, uh, the title says Paganism Within the Church. Um, Really, could this be true? You know, there's lots of things that have happened throughout the centuries where things have crept in to the worship of God. And I thought it would be good today to cover some of these things that we know that, he, that is, has its roots in paganism. The Bible verse that we're going to go to today comes from Matthew. So if you'd like to get your Bibles, it comes from Matthew chapter 15. We're going to be re- reading verses 8, 9, and we will skip to 13. So that's Matthew chapter 15, verses 8, 9, and 13. And when you are there, we'll say, t- say amen so I know. Okay, so the, it, go, it says this. This people draws nigh to me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Verse 9. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And verse 13, if we skip to verse 13, it says... Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. So, first of all, I'd just like to welcome everyone here present today. It's lovely to see uh, Jonathan's mother here as well. You know, we've not seen her in a while here. And it's lovely to see Paolo and his family and every other guest that's here today. And I do pray that God is with you today throughout this um, service. So the subject that I will be um, touching on today and presenting to you will be about Easter. Um, I felt it fitting because we are in the Easter weekend. And throughout the Christian world, Easter is regarded as a, a religious, Christian religious festival. But I wanted to go and see what the Bible has to say about Easter Um, And I want to take you through what we're going to learn, what the Bible tells us and what we should be doing and what we should not be doing. One good text comes to mind before I endeavour to present this message to you. And it comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. And it tells us that prove all things, hold fast that which is good. So... We are being admonished to prove all things. You know, within our worship, we shouldn't just do it because granddad did it or because we've been told to do it. When it comes to the worship of God, the Christian and only true God, we need to understand how God wants us to worship him. And it doesn't matter if we've been doing it for hundreds of years. It doesn't necessarily mean it's right. You know, when I became a Christian and everybody went to church on Sunday, I initially thought it was right. But only when I started digging, because Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And when people are genuinely searching for a knowledge of the living God, God promises that he will lead us into the truth. And I actually thought Sunday was the Lord's day, but through long research and study, I came to the conclusion that Sunday was not God's day. And actually that the Sabbath, in which is what we are keeping here today, and as we all know, is the official day that we're called to worship God on, the seventh day of the week. So brethren, along this Christian journey, which we are all on, as you know, there's some plants that the devil has planted along the way. And Jesus says... 
Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. So throughout this presentation, we're going to be rooting up some plants that our heavenly Father has not planted. Today, we will be applying a, a term called the acid test. Have anybody heard of the acid test? So for those that are in the business of buying and selling gold, in this market, there's lots of fake gold going around. Has anybody ever bought a chain and seen it go green around their neck before and realised that they've not bought the precious metal that they actually thought they had? So within the, the industry, there's ways to achieve and to know the purity of the gold and whether it is gold or it is base metal. So what they do is, what the jewellers do, they get a little black block, which is like a, a sandpaper block, and they'll scratch the gold in an area where hopefully you don't want to damage it, and they will ap apply nitric acid to the gold, and if the gold dissolves, if the dust that was come from the, the piece of precious metal dissolves, it proves that it was not gold. Because through sweat and oxidization, um, that's why you notice um, base metals will change colour because they will be affected by the chemicals. So it's a good way of finding out what is true and what is not. So to me, in a similar way, Easter has the stamp on it. But is it really? Today we're going to be looking at and we're going to be applying the acid test to Easter. And we're going to be using God's word as the acid test to see if Easter is really in the Christian, um, is really we're told to keep Easter. So we know that this, um, e this celebration is obviously, it talks about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. To the world in general, along with um, most of, basically Easter is regarded as one of the most important annual Christian festivals commemorating the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for the Pope, best part of my life, I've kept Easter. Um, and some of us, we all know that who likes a chocolate egg on Easter? And who likes all the little funny things that come with it, the bunny rabbit and all the other things that um, have come into this celebration of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so we're going to be looking at some of these things today. But um, what I would say is we have to ask some important questions. I never ever want to take away from the importance of what Jesus has done for us at Calvary. That is what all the hopes as a Christian hang on. What he did for us. You know, we told that through the garden when he was betrayed by his own brethren, Judas, that he was led away. And there was a kangaroo, a kangaroo court erected late at night, a, speed, a, speed, a court that was speedily put in together behind closed doors so they could quickly find false accusations against Jesus. We know that it was hurried together because they knew that they really didn't have a leg to stand on. They needed to get Jesus basically done and dealt with before people would have found out that they would have held him. And then we see that he gets delivered to Pilate and Pilate, funny enough, finds no fault in him. In Luke 23, verse 4, it says, I find no fault in him. And I thought it was so fitting when I was reading this. I thought, when the lamb came before the priests, as we've looked in the little sanctuary that we're teaching the children, that the lamb had to be spotless and blameless. There had to be nothing wrong with it. And here, unbeknown to Pilate, we see him virtually inspecting the lamb. And given it, I find no fault in it. So we know that Christ, there was no fault in him. And even a heathen ruler was declaring there was no fault in him. Then we see he was rushed on to Herod. And Herod, we'd been waiting to see him for a long, long time. He'd heard many things about Jesus. And he wanted Jesus to sort of like basically perform some miracles in front of him. And maybe he'd probably be able to do something. But Jesus just stayed silent. They arrayed him in robes and laughed and mocked him. And then we see that he was delivered back to Pilate. And Pilate, 
the man that he was, he, he, in the, he, says, he brings him out before the Jews and says, I find no fault in him. The, you know, I've examined him under the, under the criteria. And the Jews turn around and say, deliver him, we don't want him, crucify him. Pilate panics, he thinks, what shall I do? Shall I um, do what they say or shall I try and get him released? So he's, they do one, there's a thing that they did once every now and again where they release a prisoner. So he thinks, you know what, I'll appease them because he wanted to release Jesus. But um, he offers them Barabbas, who was, a, he was in for sedition and crime and killing. Um, and the Jews scream, crucify him. We want Barabbas, not Jesus. So we see that Jesus then is led away to be scourged and mocked. And throughout the night, Jesus is really badly beaten. You know, he's beaten to an extent that probably some of us will never ever imagine. Um, throughout the night, and then we see that the morning, his, the cross is thrown upon his shoulders. Um, and Ellen G. White says he couldn't, he couldn't even carry it. It was that heavy. She went, three times he fell because the cross was that heavy. And then we see that Simon, he was a secret follower of Jesus, was coming along the way. The, the, the Roman soldiers grabbed him, thrust him in towards where Jesus was and made him carry the cross. And we see that Jesus, struggling, limping, weak, he, he makes his way with Simon. And we see that when they lay him down on the cross, we've never forgot to forget the nails that they put in his hand and his feet. And each one was driven for me and you. And we're told that when they thrust him up onto the cross, the shudder and the pain that he went through, because this cross was deep into the ground, and when they flipped it up, Jesus would have suffered profusely, and um, something that we'll never ever be able to understand. And then what we're told is, as he was on the cross, he was praying for me and you, and for his enemies. And his own mother was pulled away because she could not bear to see what they were doing to Jesus. We're told that when he passed away, and we do believe that um, Jesus did die, and on, fr on, on fir the first day of the week he rose. So we do not deny that Jesus rose on Sunday, the first day of the week. And what we're told is, even through the inspiration of Ellen G. White, that on the Sabbath, when the disciples were resting and they were sorrowing for what had happened to Jesus, because they didn't expect what had happened to him, they actually thought that he would overrule and, and come off victorious. But while they were mourning, we told that the, the, the priests, they were scared because they were worried that um, the disciples might take him away. But more of all, that he said after three days, I will arise again. So they stationed Roman guards around the, t around the tomb. And the, the reason why they stationed it, because who's going to go near the, 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 the tomb while the guards are all there in full array? But what they didn't realise is angels were up in the sky watching waiting for the, the time when the command should be given to roll the stone back. And we're told in the, through the, the Bible and the pen of inspiration that an angel was sent like a bolt of lightning from heaven. Could you imagine it? Have you seen shooting stars? You know, you could imagine it. Boom, it would have just exploded. It, the, the light penetrated. And we're told that the guards recoiled back and they all fell as dead men. And that's how some of us will fall if we don't repent when Jesus comes. And then what we're told is the, the stone, the shaft that was blocking the stone from um, rolling was ripped out of the way. The, the angel removed the stone and removed the napkin off Jesus. And they says, Son of God, come forth. Your Father calleth for you. And Jesus arose. So I don't ever want to take away the importance of what that means to us. But today, we're going to be looking at Easter and are we commanded to keep it in the Bible? Because we see it in every church. Today, we've got Easter Friday. It's a whole build-up. You've got Shrove Tuesday, Ash Wednesday, Maud Thursday, Good Friday. These are all the days that we see that are, are being incorporated, maybe not necessarily in our church, but other churches, and 
we need to shine a light where in a dark place, you know, and it is our, it is our duty as Christians to defend the truth. Sometimes the truth is not good because it hurts. We all may have been secretly practicing Easter without you knowing about it. So just because you don't see it in the church, that doesn't mean individuals are not actually practicing it on it in this day. So some of the most important questions that we will be asking, and I have got some slides, so please stay awake. Is this really a Christian observance? That's one of the questions. Is the Christian really required to observe this or any other so-called festival? Is the origin of Easter based on the Bible and its Christian teachings or something else? The Roman Catholic Church and other mainstream denominations place a great emphasis on Easter as the essential event on the Christian calendar. However, upon close inspection, we will discover that Easter is also enshrined in many non-Christian practices. But first, like I say, we will not talk about, we will not negate from the fact and the blessing that we had from the cross. We need to emphasize that. Christ was crucified on Friday. All the gospels agree on this. So this is why people keep Easter, because they agree that Christ was crucified on the Friday just before the Sabbath, which is Saturday, was to begin. After eating the Passover supper, which was the last supper, that evening they went out to the Mount of Olives, Jesus, with his, with his disciples, then onto the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was betrayed by Judas, arrested, tried, found guilty, and crucified the next morning, Passover day, in the third hour and died later that afternoon around 3 p.m. So, which was just before, and he arose the first day of the week, which we look, if you look in Luke 24, verse 1, it tells you that he arose on the first day of the week. And most people and Christians around the world tend to keep Sunday, and they call that the seventh day of the week, when the Bible tells us that he arose on the first day of the week. And we know that the Sunday is the first day of the week according to Scripture. So, brother, I'm not taking away anything from the importance of Jesus in his sacrifice. Did you know the word Easter is not in the New Testament? You know, where does the word come from? You know, I was going to say, shall I say Happy Easter today? Or shall I say Happy Sabbath? Um, so it's not in the New Testament and nor its relation as a holiday to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Have you noticed for years it's been celebrated but we cannot find anywhere in the Bible where it tells us to honour this pagan holiday. But for it, throughout the whole Christian world it is reverenced and even amongst Seventh-day Adventists it is a day where we actually start getting on board with the other churches and, G and Jesus tells us, come out, be ye separate. Yeah? I will tell you, and we will learn, there is some things we need to remember. So, the, there's, there's, there's two things that we're firstly told to remember. The Sabbath day. Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labour and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle that was within thy gates. For in six days the Lord God made the heaven and the earth, and he rested on the seventh day. And wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So we know that there is a day that we are supposed to observe as Christians. And also, there is another day that we're told to observe. The Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. But the Lord's Supper is not on Easter Sunday, is it? And we did know that he died just a few days before the resurrection and that did take place, the Lord's Supper. We're told in Luke 22, verse 19, Jesus says, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So what we're told is, when, he was, when they were having that Last Supper meal, 
and Jesus was breaking the bread and giving them the unfermented grape juice. And as we know in other denominations, that is a fermented juice and they're actually um, using real alcohol. And the, it was meant to be pure grape juice because it was representative of the pure blood of Jesus Christ, uncorrupted. But we know that even if they want to keep, um, if they're doing the communion, the communion's been distorted. But we're told that we are to recognise Holy Communion. But we're not told to do it once a year. We're not told to do it on Sunday. We're told to do it, and as often as you do do it, within the Adventist Church, I think we've talked, we do it once every third month, isn't it? But even that is not the, the rule. The rule is whenever you do recognise it, you're doing it, and you're remembering my death and my resurrection. So which day do I remember God's death and resurrection? Is it Easter Sunday, or is it when I do communion? But we're doing Easter Sunday, yeah? Easter Sunday is there and people want to practice Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday has nothing at all to do with the Bible. So, I will read from, if you get your Bibles, we will go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and we're going to read what Paul said about communion. So when you are there, because I do hope and pray you use your Bibles, uh, because as we learned in the Sabbath school lesson, God speaks to us directly through his word, and all of us can hear him. We just need to listen and obey. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, and we're going to read through to 26. It says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, verse 24, and when he, was, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me, verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had sipped, saying, This is the cup of the New Testament in my blood, this do ye. As often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. So which is the one that we're going to celebrate that's going to show his death till he comes? It's the Lord's Supper, communion. Jesus arose from the dead nearly 2,000 years ago. And it was actually on the Jewish calendar, which was Nisan uh, 16. That was the date it was on. Three days after the Passover on Nisan 14, a date which, when annually remembered, can fall on any day of the week, not only on Sunday, right? So even if you said, if you was, because I always look at it like this, and the strange thing was, is I was about to present this message, and someone in work came to me last week and says, why is Easter on a different day? I mean, the, the date, yeah, not a different day. And I was like, why, what are you on about? He goes, because what's his name passed away last year in work, because he had a heart attack, we, had a, we lost a colleague in work. And I was like, it's funny how you're saying that because I'm about to be preaching on it and I can tell you why Easter's not on the same day all the time. He was like, well, why is that? And in a minute we're going to get into why is Easter's not on the same day all, all the time. But, um, so yeah, annual memorials are never limited to a day of the week, but rather a date falling on any day by the natural cycle of the calendar. So think about this. If my mother died in 1990 or whatever on the 20th of September I would recognise it no matter what day it was on the 25th of September every year wouldn't I if I wanted to if I wanted to commemorate my mother's death or my nan's death I wouldn't say you know what I'll just always exalt Sunday and we will always make Sunday special like even if it was Tuesday and I think let me just bring it back to Sunday because Sunday is the special day we know that Sunday throughout paganism is the day that's always lifted up above every other day. And it always has special attention within the Catholic Church. So, like I said, why do the days change? This is the question I, I, I ask myself. And don't get me wrong, some Christians do keep that day, that, that 14th of Nisan. 
And you know what? If you want to keep that day, at least you're keeping the right day. But that day could fall on any day. That could day could fall on a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday. But why does Easter have to fall on this Sunday? And we're going to learn. So, if you look at the slide... Easter and its origins. Look at the bunny. It's all so sweet on Easter's day, isn't it? When we go into Tesco and we see all the bunnies and we go into Sainsbury's and all the children are shouting and screaming for a chocolate egg. Um, and don't get me wrong, before I became a Christian and even being a Christian, I've received eggs from colleagues and stuff at work. But we are going to be looking at the, the, the origins. You know, when we look at the roots of something, can you imagine? Roots are always hid under the ground, aren't they? You can't really see the roots until you start digging in the soil. We're going to do a little bit of digging in the soil today and we're going to have a look at some of these roots because remember, Easter's up here, but I want to find out what's down on the stem, down below. Where did it come from? You know, so we know that Easter, um, it dates back very, very far and there's a reason for that. And we do know that throughout the century, Satan's been counterfeiting. He's been um, subjugating other things for the worship of God. Any, any way he can try and obscure the true worship of the one true God, Satan is there in the midst. So, as Christians, Jesus calls us to be separate. You know, how can you be separate? How can you be distinct? Because, you, you know, you have to say to people, I don't celebrate this day. Why? Because this. This is the reason why. The goddess Ishtar doesn't Ishtar and Easter sound so the same? You could have just, I could have just said, happy Ishtar. You probably wouldn't have even knew. The, the goddess Ishtar was a fertility and a god of war. It's the Akkadian name of the Sumerian goddess Inanna and the Semitic goddess Astart. The three names refer to the same deity in different cultural contexts. She inspired great devotion in the ancient Babylonian Empire. See, this is going back to Babylon. This is going back to, you know who she was? She was the queen of Babylon. The queen goddess of Babylon. And we see that Mary's, Mary, Mother Mary in the Catholic Church has been exalted on the same level. She's the queen of heaven. So it says, in different cultural contexts, she inspired a great devotion in ancient Babylon, as evidenced by the more gr- the grand temples. So we know that throughout Babylon, there was massive temples erected to this goddess. Altars and inscriptions, even looking at the artifacts that we see today, we can find evidence where the Babylonians worshipped um, Ishtar. And just by coincidence, they worship her around the same time as Easter. Um, and objects devoted to her. The name Ishtar is likely Semitic in origin and was identified in ancient times with the Canaanite goddess Ashtaroth from the Hebrew Bible. So we know that the Jews were up to some worship. Who's ever heard of Ashtaroth from the Bible? This is when they were, they were in apostasy and they were worshipping the host of heaven. In the 6th century BC, the great Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar who obviously we do a lot of studies on in the book of Daniel, he constructed the mammoth Ishtar gate in honour of the goddess. And I'm going to show you the gate. See this big gate? This is the gate that Nebuchadnezzar had built in honour of Ishtar because obviously we know that throughout the Babylonian Empire they worshipped numerous gods. But this was one that um, was highly exalted. And... Easter was, the, was originally the celebration of Ishtar. So when we're celebrating Easter, we're not celebrating anything really to do with Jesus. We need to get that right. The Assyrian and the Babylonian goddess of fertility and sex. Her symbols, like the egg and the bunny, were and still are fertility and sex symbols. So when we're giving these eggs out and these little bunnies, they represent fertility and sex. Because have you ever heard the term, if you are English and from England, you may have heard it, attic like rabbits. The reason why they say that, because rabbits reproduce in the spring. They reproduce in the spring quite a lot. And the reason why they used the the rabbit as a term, because it was about sex and there was lots of things going on. Um, 
So bunnies are not as innocent as they look. And one thing I've come to the conclusion is throughout my Christian walk is Satan's so good at making things look so um, sweet and innocent. You know, because what's wrong with an egg? Like a little chocolate egg. But we don't realise that the roots behind the, the egg are very, very sinister. And he, he dresses things up in such a nice way that um, the children want it. And we always think, you know what, I'll compromise. You know, it's not that bad after all. It's not that bad after all. Um, you know, this is where we end up going. And it's like Satan's whispering to you, is in their ear. Go on, it's only an Easter egg. But in reality, the roots, and unfortunately not many people know. There's lots of innocent people out there that are buying Easter eggs because it's chocolate and it's something nice to eat for the children. Um, but one thing I've noticed with Easter as well, which is something so wrong, you end up, when I used to be not a Christian, I'd end up with about 20 eggs. Everybody in my family bought me an Easter egg. You know, it's not a very healthy thing. It's not, it's like, it's not like the Lord wants us to be overloaded with all that poison. You know, and all these eggs, which like you're just eating these eggs for days, chocolate for like three or four weeks. So when we think about Easter, we need to think about it in a different context. The Great Controversy, chapter three. Um, sorry, let me just get this book just so you can see it on the camera. Um, the Great Controversy in chapter three, it says this compromise between paganism and Christianity. So in the early part of the probably two, three hundred years after the death of Christ, we're told that pagan, Satan was losing the battle. So when they were killing the Christians and throwing them in the amphitheatres because they was basically dragging them before emperors saying, you better denounce your faith and say that you hate the Lord. And these people wouldn't. So they were, they were making big coliseums and saying, you know what, we will have some fun games with them. We will throw them in the coliseums and we will... We will put skins around them and light them as... Did you know Nero, you got Christians and he put skins around them and lit them in his garden like candles in his like mansion place. This is what we're told. This is how evil it got. But what we're told is, in, and Ellen G. White tells us about this, the great controversy in chapter 3, she says that the devil had a different plan. Have you ever heard the term, if you can't beat them, join them? This is what the devil's next mode of um, plan was. They've thought we're killing them, it's not doing any good. We need to get in there. We need, we need to start infiltrating. And for those of you that don't know, we know that the Jesuits are working even up until today in infiltrating our churches and becoming pastors and preachers over... They, they don't just come in and say, I want to be a pastor. These have been born with a mission. They come into the church and they are the nicest people you'll ever meet and they would never ever let you know that they was a Jesuit. And then they slowly take us away from the truth. Little tweaks here, little bits of doubt to the students. Oh, it's not necessarily that important. You can't overcome sin. These are the things we hear. Whenever you hear it, you know someone's, there's, there's, there's something not right with that. So it says, The compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin. The man of sin was foretold in prophecy. So we're told that he was long foretold what was going to happen. It says, opposing and exalting himself above God. This gigantic system Ellen G. White talks about, and I put in brackets because she actually means the Catholic Church, is a masterpiece of Satan's power. See, Satan's got himself a church on earth, and he's got his worshippers, and he's got his priests, and his false prophets, all working. A monument of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne to rule the earth according to his will. Little by little... At first by stealth and silence. See, this is what happens. This is why God's put us as defenders of truth. Because when we're little compromising weaklings, that's what Satan loves. Oh, it's too much hassle, you know, just let them do that. You know, Jesus wants us to stand in defense of the truth. And that means no compromise. That's what it means as Christians. It means no compromise in your life, in your diet. If you're hanging around with people that are a bad influence, stop compromising. You know what I mean? He's put you as a defender of the truth. You know, you need to take up that banner and actually fight for the truth. Jesus did. Little by little, at first by stealth and silence, and then more openly as it increased in strength, so as, as it became, paganism became to become more involved, basically, the minds of men, the mystery of iniquity, carried forward the deceptive and blasphemous work. We're going to read the next part of the 
this quote. The spirit of compromise, which is an unfortunate thing, but we do find it within ourselves a lot of times is and within the church and conformity was restrained for a time so in the early centuries it was restrained for a time and you know what was the thing that restrained it when God let persecution come upon the church because you know what there weren't no false brethren in the church then there weren't no false people half-hearted Christians in the church then that as soon as they knew trouble were coming their way they were gone what that did is that separated the wheat from the chaff so the Lord wanted to literally have a little bit of separation. But you know what happened? And I was thinking about this. Basically, we will read this and then we'll go and talk about it. It says, fierce persecution which endured under paganism. But as persecution ceased, this is when paganism started to come in, and Christianity entered the courts and palaces of kings, she laid aside the humble simplicity of Christ and his apostles for the pomp and pride of the pagan priests and rulers. And in place of the requirements of God, she substituted human theories and traditions. The nominal conversion of Constantine the Great in the early part of the 4th century caused great rejoicing and the world, cloaked with a form of righteousness, walked into the church. So the, the world, cloaked in a form of righteousness, walked into the church. The world walked into the church with its coat on. Um, now the work of corruption rapidly progressed. Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. The sp her spirit controlled the church. Her doctorings, ceremonies and superstitions were incorporated into the faith and worship of the professed followers of Christ. So her doctrines, her ceremonies, her superstitions were incorporated into the Christian faith. So that's why when we do things, we need to have a thus saith the Lord God. And we need to search our Bibles, it, not because it is so or someone said it's so. We need to know firmly why we would believe what we believe. Because not everything is as innocent as it looks. And I was thinking, you know, the Christians, they loved it. When the persecution ceased and Constantine declared, because he had a nominal conversion, meaning nominal means in name only because we know Constantine's conversion was not a real conversion this was a plan this was we've been killing them and you know what they're just growing let's have a conversion let's pretend I'm a Christian and we will start incorporating all of our gods and goddesses into the Christian religion and we will start we will get them unknowingly worshipping our gods and we will laugh behind their back but in reality, they'll think they're worshipping their gods, but in reality, they're worshipping idols. And I thought to myself, is imagine how happy they were when that persecution ceased. They were like, oh, Constantine's became a Christian. We're all safe now. Even the lukewarm Christians come out of the hiding place because even they could practice their religion in peace without worrying about being persecuted. And I thought to myself, is imagine today or tomorrow if they said, oh, we're going to accept the Sabbath. It's all good, the governments. What would happen with that Sabbath after a 20 or 50 or 100 years? It would be polluted and paganism would creep in, the original Sabbath I'm talking about. So we've got to guard the truth. See, here's another thing. So what the Satan does and what he's good at is, over time, the goddesses' names change, but they're still the same people. So pagans of today, this is today, worship, not Ishtar now, but it's the same thing, is Ushtra, or that's how I thought, I phonically I looked it like I could say it. If you can pronounce it better than me, then go ahead, but I find it quite hard to pronounce. And it sounds similar to Easter again. The mystery goddess who gave Easter its name. So this is m coming down modern day now. It's widely understood that the term Easter is based on the name of an Anglo-Saxon goddess, Ushtra of which the pagan holiday is said to be based on. In 2023, Ostara and the spring equinox occur on, in March in the Northern Hemisphere. It is a time of harmony, this is what they say, the pagans, it is a time of harmony, the day of night, and now are equal. So what happens is, is the spring equinox started this year around, I think it was the 20th of March. And if you don't know what the spring equinox is, it's when basically, we start getting even, even amounts of light and day. So instead of us going from dark nights, we actually really nearly get in around, on the 20th of March, it's where it starts going back, and the days after the 20th of March, we'll start getting lighter. So you know now, like, the Sabbath is 
getting it's becoming later on a Friday night for us. The sun's not going down until later. So the spring equinox, which starts and it varies, it started this year on the 20th of March, is when the days you get equal amounts of days. So you get 12 hours day, 12 hours night, right? And then what happens is from that point, they wait for the, the pagans wait for the first full moon to occur after that point. And the first full moon occurred on the 6th of April. And then they say, and we're going to recognise Easter Sunday for the first Sunday after the first full moon. And this is why Sunday is always on Sunday. Because in reality, we're worshipping, you could say the moon, you could say the sun. And it, it goes that far back, they even... The Babylonians believed some things that we're going to learn. Many people around the world celebrate the beginning of spring seasons. It's such a happy time as the birds sing. You know, spring's a lovely time and God's created the seasons. You know, there's nothing wrong with looking out there and admiring the things that God has done. We're told that God has created these things for signs and seasons. So, but we always know that Satan's there to try and change what God has done. So, why does the date for Easter change every year? You know, it's something, I, like I said earlier, at the end of the day, if you lost someone and they died on a certain date, you would keep that date. Christmas doesn't change. I don't know why the pagans don't mess around with that one, because Christmas is always on the 25th, no matter what date it lands on. They always keep it on the 25th. They don't say, oh, you know what, we'll keep it on a Sunday because that's just convenient or, or whatever. So the day of Easter changes every year, and this is what I got off their website, for spiritual reasons. I was thinking, because they know, they, the pagans know this is a spiritual festival. Um, Easter is always set to coincide with the first Sunday, and this is where you might as a Christian think, oh, that's got Jewish roots, for, of, after the Paschal full moon, which really means a pink full moon, which is the first full moon after the spring equinox. That's why the date changes every year. As the, as the first Sunday doesn't always fall on the same date. So, for instance, spring equinox this year in 2023 landed on a Monday, the 20th of March. And the first full moon was April the 6th. So then, what they say is then we keep, well, the world keeps, April the 9th, which is tomorrow, because that's the first Sunday after the first full moon. Do you get where I'm going with this? Where in, where in Jesus do you see this? You know, and, and we're, we're easy to get on board with these things. Tell me where I see the Lord in this. I, I, I see pagan worship all over it, imprinted all over it. And then, it's, and then it's, so for instance, the reason the Sunday being this Sunday, then I got then, so last year, guess when Easter landed on? 17th of April. And then it reminds me of this verse, 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 16. They forsook all the commandments of the Lord their God and made themselves molten images, even two calves, and made Asheroth and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. This is what they did, you know, when they were worshipping the host of heaven. Right, let's have a look at some symbolism with eggs. What do eggs represent in the Bible? Well, in paganism. Eggs occupy a special status during Easter observance. They're symbols of rebirth and renewal. This is what the pagans tell us. Life bursts forth from this otherwise plain, inanimate object that gives no hint as to what it contains. In this regard, this is, this is why you know there was... Can you imagine why the Christians so compromised? It was like, oh, that's so similar. We could incorporate that into the resurrection. This is, what they, this is how it's happened. It's saying... In this regard, it was a handy symbol for the resurrection of Jesus. So you can imagine, some, oh, we could do something with that egg. We could turn that into, the egg represents Christ, the, the, being rebirthed and new, born at like resurrection, rising again. Um, but it is a symbol that has held this meaning long before Christianity adopted it. Decorate, check this out, decorating eggs is an ancient tradition that dates back centuries the Ukrainian Museum states that the pastime of decorating eggs, called Sanki, goes back to antiquity in Ukraine. People believed in intricately decorated eggs, you know, when you see them really good. Because don't get me wrong, there's some very good designs on these eggs. Um, were talisman, 
that would bring them good luck and protect them against evil. Taliman meaning they, they thought like they were magic, these eggs. You know, when you see these, um, what's them eggs with the white and the yellow inside? Cabri egg. Yeah. So they actually thought that they was um, talisman and they had magic powers that could protect them from evil. And this is in Ukraine. This is when you go in the museum. You could probably pronounce that word better than me. Couldn't you, sister? <laughs> eh? There you go. Yeah. Yeah, because it's like design. Yeah, brilliant. Well, you know, as I was at, when I was putting it in, I was actually going to contact my Ukrainian friends and ask me how I, how I could pronounce this word. But then I went on YouTube and it showed me the phonics and I thought, I'll, I'll go from there. But I was actually going to contact Lilia. Um, so, it's not, as easy, it's not as innocent as we see. Ancient Egyptians, check this out, believed in a primitive egg from which the sun god hatched. <sighs> Who's rising on Sunday, eh? Who's just rose on Sunday? Ain't Jesus. It's the ancient sun god. And just by coincidence, we get him on Sunday. The day when we worship the sun. Easter's been subjugated and replaced. And this is why I felt I was in two minds whether to present this because I don't want to offend anybody. Because I know many people, sentimental, Easter means quite a lot, especially those that have been deceived. But I thought, no, it's fitting. As God's people, we need to present truth. Um, Alternative, the sun was sometimes discussed as an egg itself laid daily by the celestial goose called Seb, the god of the earth. The phoenix is said to have emerged from this egg. The egg is also discussed in terms of of our world egg, moulded by, this is some other god that the the Babylonians had, Kehum, from a lump of clay on his potter's wheel. We know that God did make us from clay, but it weren't this gentleman. Even the act of colouring eggs is, is tied to the idea of rebirth and resurrection. While egg decorating kits offer a vibrant means of decorating eggs today, the link between the life and eggs was traditionally made by using a red colouring. There's some very sinister things behind the reason why they co- um, painted eggs red. We no- normally in the the nominal churches and the other churches, they'll paint the red and they'll say it's representative of Christ's blood on the egg. But we're told that there were some very sinister things. I won't go in there today, but you need to go and do some research on what they did with this egg. And it was not covered in um, paint. It was actually covered in blood. So these eggs, what we see, is not what we're really being told. It has been a tradition to bring a red egg to church and to eat it when the priest proclaims Christ is risen as the Easter vigil and the Lenten fast is officially broken. And I was thinking about the Lent and the 40 days fast. Did you know Ellen G. White says, we don't need to do them fasts. And God says, the fast that I have called is to release the bonds of the poor and the oppressed. You know, these fasts for 40 days, we don't need to do them. We We can eat moderately clean food. We can fast and pray for a day here and a day there, but these 40 days of fast is not required. And Angie White tells us, Jesus did that for us. And what we are told as well, when they do these fasting, um, you have Shrove Tuesday, which actually means Fat Tuesday, because what they were doing was, what the Catholics do is, before they are preparing for the, the 40 days of Lent, they eat all they can. So it's literally like, eat everything out your cupboard because I'm going to be having to abstain from some of the things that I actually love doing. So there's, a, there's an element of gluttony in there as well and one of, that's one of the things that God tells us not to do. Um, rabbit symbolism. Let's have a look at the rabbit. The spiritual meaning of a rabbit. I thought this was a good picture because what's behind the rabbit? Stonehenge. So what does Stonehenge represent? It's the altar of the pagans, isn't it? This is where they worship the winter, the sun, the moon, all the different luminaries that the Lord God has created. And we always see that the hair, it was actually a hair, not um, a rabbit. Um, and I wanted to look at some of the symbols, what some of the religions and just some cultures actually say about the rabbit. 
And I was looking at some of the Aztecs and some of the other Americans, the old Americans. They actually thought the rabbit, they, they, they had it categorised as a very crafty creature. You know what I mean? It, that's what they had it down like, some of these cultures. And we'll just look at one. Ancient Egypt, as in many cultures, to the ancient Egyptians, rabbits symbolised spring and rebirth. They also had a deity named Unut, who was sometimes depicted as having a hare's head and a woman's body. See, when we start looking at this, we are going really far back, aren't we? You know, the rabbit, it's not as innocent as we see. And, and, and in the Germanic beliefs, the Germanic people believed in a fertility goddess named Ishtro, who we've seen earlier, who was associated with spring and rebirth. She was often depicted with rabbits, and this pre-Christian imagery is partly why rabbits have now become associated with Easter. Like in many traditional beliefs, they are seen as symbolising fertility, that, but they can also represent new beginnings. This is mainly due to their association with springtime and rebirth, which harks back to many other older beliefs. Are you following me? So, I've got another thing. Hot cross buns. I used to love hot cross buns. You know, my nan, and, my nan was a Catholic, very um, ardent Catholic, very lovely woman. And you know what? The, the, the hot cross bun was so nice with the, with the little raisins inside it and the cross that was, I thought, represented the Lord Jesus' cross. But when you actually start having a good look and a digging deep in this, you'll find out that this ain't what it says it is. And the hot cross bun is actually a little pagan treat. Pagans would bake buns marked with a cross as a tribute to their goddess who represented fertility and rebirth. A pagan version of the hot cross bun used the cross to represent the four quadrants of the moon and was eaten as part of a month-long festival that celebrated the end of winter. See, we've just come to the end of winter. We're in spring. That was what they were doing. The Christians saw the crucifixion. <laughs> oh, it's so nice, isn't it? What the, this is how lukewarm the Christians were. Oh, that looks like a cross. We could use that and we could actually have that on their pagan holiday. The Christians saw the crucifixion in the cross on the, on the bun and as with many pre-Christian traditions replaced their pagan meaning with a Christian one. The resurrection of Christ at Easter. Lots happening. Lots of fake and um, mysterious meaning to a lot of these things but I was reading this from Ellen G. White and I'll show you it. And I, this was from a devotional. I know it's on the 25th of July, but I was reading it. It says, There is no place for tradition, for man's theories and conclusions, or for church legislation. No laws ordained by ecclesiastical authority are included in the commission. None of these are Christ's servants to teach. The law and the prophets, with the record of his own words and deeds, are the treasure committed to the disciples to be given to the world. Christ's name is their watchword, their badge of distinction, their bond of union, the authority for their course of action and the source of their success. Nothing that does not bear his subscription is to be rec not recognized is to be nothing that does not bear his subscription is to be recognized in his kingdom. And like I said to you today, gold has a hallmark Easter has a hallmark, but it doesn't have Christ's inscription on it. So as much as I would have liked to have wished you a happy, I would prefer to wish you a happy Sabbath. And in closing, the acid test is complete. Christ presented, this is what we need to do, the shield of truth, saying, it is written to every suggestion of the adversary. And you know me, I say, brethren, go and do likewise, and you will be all right. So the aim is clear today. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, that's what John said, prepare ye the way of the Lord and make them crooked paths straight. In closing, I pray that no harm is done to any of you, and I pray that God will help you always see the truth in everything, and that Although you may have found this quite um, daunting or maybe surprising, you know, the truth is the truth and we must proclaim it. 
and we must point out error where it is. So um, thank you for today, and may God be with you. Amen.